Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1160 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The FCC tells the ARRL this week that amateur operators' email addresses will continue to be kept private. HF over the horizon radars continue to be troublemakers on the low bands. An Australian battery manufacturer develops a new improved energy output battery. The annual WX4 NHC on the air test is set for Saturday, May 29th. The Red Cross Emergency Communications Spring 2021 drill was a nationwide success. The ARRL Spring Section Manager election results are announced. We will bring them to you. One amateur sets a new record for completing WAC in six minutes. And a German television network, ZDF, in cooperation with the BBC, has produced a new documentary entitled A Spy in Every Embassy. We will have all the details and a whole lot more coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about the dark side ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline and will give us an update on Elon Musk's Starlink system. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will talk about soldering irons and software. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Contanelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take a look at the state of amateur radio in the year 1962. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about how to repair and do maintenance on towered guy wires. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny and warm blue sky, Albany, New York. Yeah, we went directly from winter to summer. I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from New York State's Catskill Mountains, where we went from snow flurries just a week ago to 90 degrees yesterday, I'm Don Julek, K2ATJ. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where it's forecast for us to see sunshine for the next seven days here in Paradise, I'm Fred, November Fox, 2 Fox. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the temperature's really beginning to heat up, I'm Eric Sotel, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we were hoping to dry out this week, but the faucet is still turned on, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Leading off the news this week, starting on June 29th, all applications filed with the FCC must include an email address for FCC correspondence. For more details on this new regulation, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters. After receipt of the initial announcement that all future applications would require an email address, ARRL was concerned for the privacy of its members and requested that amateurs' email addresses not be made public. This past week, the FCC agreed, stating in an email to ARRL Council that it will continue to mask amateurs' email addresses from public view in the Universal Licensing System, the ULS. The FCC will use the email address supplied by amateurs to correspond with applicants, including sending a link to the official electronic copy of their license when an application is granted. The FCC is transitioning to fully electronic correspondence and no longer mails hard copy licenses, remember those? Amateurs are able to view, download, and print their official license grant using the ULS. When a license is first granted, each applicant will receive an email with a direct link to the license. 
Although the link expires in 30 days, the license itself will remain available in the ULS and may be downloaded at any time by signing into the licensee's account using their FCC registration number and password. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. On or after June 29th, a valid email address must be provided with each application and must be kept current by filing a modification application as necessary. Under the amended section 97.23, the email address must be an address where the grantee can receive electronics correspondence. Revocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license may result when correspondence from the FCC is returned as undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct email address. Applicants lacking an email address should consider using the email address of a friend or family member on their FCC applications. Here is a reminder. Due to changes the FCC has made to its licensing system, starting on Thursday, May 20th, all amateur exam applicants must provide their FRN to the volunteer examiners before taking an amateur exam. Prospective new FCC licensees will be required to obtain an FRN before the examination and provide that number to the volunteer examiners on Form 605 license applications. An FCC instructional video provides step-by-step -step instructions on how to obtain an FRN through the FCC's Commission Registration System. The FRN is used afterward by the applicant to download the official license document from the FCC's Universal Licensing System to upgrade a license, apply for a vanity call sign, and to submit administrative updates such as address and email changes and renew applications. The biggest headache for International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 monitoring service participants continues to be the HF over-the-horizon radars. With more details and a little audio of what these radars sound like, we go to League Headquarters where Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, files this report. Already an interference issue for several years, OTHR activity seems to be multiplying exponentially. Most of the stations are located in Russia and China, like this one. In the April edition of the IARUMS monthly newsletter, coordinator Peter Jost, HB9CET, said it's the same troublemakers every month. Reports from Europe and Africa showed OTHR signals littering the 20-meter phone band, with some also showing up as high as 15 meters, as well as down on 40 meters and lower. These include the infamous Foghorn OTHR, so-called because of the sound of the approximately 10 kilohertz wide transmission, mostly in short bursts. The Russian container OTHR has also been spotted on 20 meters and elsewhere, generating an approximately 12 kilohertz bandwidth signal that sounds like this. A newcomer of sorts has been Super Dual Auroral Radar Network, or Super Darn, HF radar signals causing interference to radio amateurs on 14.210 and possibly elsewhere. A lot of those signals, by the way, are not only heard in Region 1, they're heard all around the world. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Super Darn system is an international scientific radar network consisting of 35 HF radars in both the northern and southern hemispheres. These radars are primarily used to map high latitude plasma convection in the F region of the ionosphere, but they're also used to study a wider range of geospace phenomena, including geomagnetic storms. What is always surprising is how strongly intruders from the Far East can be heard in IARU Region 1, sometimes even during the day in the 40-meter band, the 160 kilohertz wideband radar, or also some other radars like the Foghorn or similar, Jost said. Super Darn Network radars look into Earth's upper atmosphere and operate continuously to observe the motion of charged particles or plasma in the ionosphere and other effects that provide scientists with information on Earth's space environment. 
Knowledge gained from this work provides insight into space weather hazards, including radiation exposure for high-altitude travelers and disruptions to communication networks, navigation systems, and electrical power grids. The Netherlands Amateur Radio Society, Veron, reports that an additional charge of 79 euros a year is being levied on amateur radio repeaters and beacons in a move that they say is detrimental to experimental radio research. On February 15, 2021, the chair of Veron, Remy Denker, sent a letter to the State Secretary for Economic Affairs and Climate responding to the Dutch government's supervision fee scheme. In addition to the existing tariff for permits for amateur radio relay and beacon stations, an additional rate of €79 Euros per year was introduced at the start of January 2021. An explanatory memorandum indicated that the reason for this additional rate lies in the additional costs incurred by the telecom agency in the Netherlands, specifically for investigation and surveillance for illegal users at relay stations. Veron requested the Secretary of State to cancel the additional rate. The illegal use of relay stations appears to apply only to 1.9% of the permits granted. The breakdown report of the Dutch government's telecom agency, their regulator, shows that this problem only applies to the national repeaters, a radio experiment in which all parties involved have agreed. Of the 162 permits, 104 are permits for beacons, where the problem does not apply. In the most recent amateur consultation, the regulator underlined once again that their general policy was to stimulate innovation and radio experimentation. But with this policy, the government is actually working against the development of technological innovation. Veron said that increasing the cost of doing experimental radio research is demotivating. At the time of the discussions, all parties, including the regulator, knew about the experiment with national repeaters. At the beginning of 2020, the first evaluation meeting took place between the regulator and the amateur associations. A follow-up was agreed to see what provisions administrators could make to prevent illegal use. This follow-up meeting was to be planned by the regulator but has not yet taken place, and Veron said that it is not right or appropriate to suddenly set an extra rate alongside the evaluation process. Veron believes that the evaluation should be completed first. In its defence, the Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate, which controls the regulator, referred to a 2014 report which states under what conditions the regulator may pass on enforcement costs to the citizen. The Ministry explained that the enforcement costs were not only for the National Repeater Project, but also the supervision of the users of these repeaters. This involved combating illegal use or warning illegal users about their behaviour. There were extra actions that went with this, such as administration, providing information and handling letter and telephone traffic. The Ministry said that if the Telecommunications Agency's commitment was reduced, then less cost would have to be passed on to the citizen. The telecom agency said that it is open to a discussion with interested parties to promote compliance so that their level of activity could possibly be reduced. As it stands, according to the ministry, the supervisory fee of €79 Euros is not sufficient to cover all the current costs of the supervision. You can read more about this at www.veron.nl A manufacturer in Brisbane, Australia is claiming to have created an aluminum-ion battery with a charging speed as much as 60 times faster than that of top-quality lithium-ion cells. The company, Graphene Manufacturing Group, also says the newly developed aluminum-ion coin cell is capable of holding three times the energy of other aluminum cells. The batteries are said to last three times longer than the lithium-ion variety. This development relies on the nanotechnology developed at the University of Queensland, according to a recent article in Forbes magazine. The battery was created by inserting aluminum atoms into perforations made in graphene planes. The company claims that because the batteries lack an upper ampere limit that would otherwise cause spontaneous overheating, the batteries also are safer. These stable base materials also facilitate their recycling later. The company hopes to bring these cells to market by the end of 2021 or early 2022. Here's a remarkable operating feat and perhaps a challenge to the rest of us. On May 18th, Rich Zwerko, K1HTV, 
completed the requirements for the Worked All Continents, or WAC, award in 11 minutes. He was operating FT-8 on 17 meters during the late afternoon. The next morning, he topped his own unofficial record, completing WAC in just six minutes. Having trouble sleeping, Zwerko connected to his station's computer via his smartphone. At 017 UTC in Virginia, 17 meters was already open to Europe, he said. Zwerko switched to 30 meter FT8 and proceeded to work some DX. And to his amazement, he was able to make FT8 contacts with all continents to complete WAC in six minutes even. Zwerko believed it might be a world record for completing WAC in the shortest time, at least using FT8. His first contact was with VK4PN. At 0725, he wrapped it up with CE3ALY in South America at 0731 UTC. All contacts were made while running 75 watts into a 30-meter trap dipole. Zwerko tells ARRL that he can operate quite nicely using his cell phone while relaxing in his recliner. So much for the vaunted BIC philosophy. The Federal Communications Commission today fined Airtel LLC and IOU Acquisitions Incorporated $3,270,290 and $207,290 respectively for providing unlicensed wireless broadband-based global positioning system services under the guise of providing radar-based location services. The companies also altered equipment to provide these services and to operate outside of the spectrum band for which they are authorized. Airtel and IOU hold authorizations to provide radio location services in the 3300 to 3650 megahertz band. These services are generally radar-based and rely on the propagation properties of radio waves to determine the position of an object for non-navigation purposes. Instead, the companies offer technologically distinct wireless broadband-based GPS services which rely on satellite communications and wireless broadband, not radio location. To offer this different service than was authorized under their FCC licenses, the company altered the settings of wireless equipment both to support this unauthorized service and to operate outside the authorized frequency bands allowed for the equipment. The Communications Act and the FCC rules require licensees to provide only the wireless services for which they are licensed in the given spectrum band and to use radio frequency devices in a manner consistent with their underlying FCC equipment authorization. These spectrum management rules are central to the FCC's vital role in organizing and coordinating spectrum use in America to avoid interference and other problems that can result from misuse. The FCC investigation was prompted by a complaint from the company's misuse of Spectrum. An FCC field agent visited their joint facility in Denver, Colorado, and a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture was issued in 2018. Both companies have ceased operating on the licenses at issue in this case. On Wednesday, May the 19th, the UK regulator, Ofcom, sent out an email to all the radio amateurs they have an email address for. The email said, Ofcom is writing to make amateurs aware of some important changes to the radio communications licenses. The changes mean that amateurs may now need to take action to make sure their radio equipment complies with a new license condition to protect the general public from exposure to electromagnetic fields. Ofcom wrote to amateurs in March 2021 to let them know that they were proposing these changes. They apply to virtually all license holders. Ofcom gave licensees until the 18th of April to submit any representations they wanted to make about the changes. Ofcom say they've listened to licensees' concerns and made some changes to the new license condition and guidance documents as a result. Full details of Ofcom's final decision are published on their website. The decision means that the amateur radio license has now been changed to include a requirement to comply with internationally recognized limits on EMF exposure. Alongside the final decision, Ofcom has published guidance on what amateurs should do to ensure compliance. They've also produced a simple EMF compliance flowchart, which tells licensees whether or not they need to take action, and if so, what action is needed. To help further, Ofcom will also shortly publish an updated version of their online calculator, which can be used to work out an appropriate compliance distance for equipment.
They are also preparing a new simplified version of the full guidance, plus specific advice for holders of amateur, ship radio and aeronautical licenses. Ofcom expects to publish these documents on their website by the 8th of June. If you haven't received the email, then it may be that Ofcom does not have an email address for you. It is thought that paper letters may be sent out in this instance, but as yet there has been no confirmation. If you believe Ofcom has your email address, but you've not received an email, then check your spam folder. Another reason for non-arrival might be that Ofcom has the wrong email address for you. To check this and correct it if necessary, you can log into the Ofcom Amateur Licensing Portal at www.ofcom.org.uk. Supporting documents plus other relevant information can be found on a dedicated EMF webpage www.ofcom.org.uk forward slash EMF. The new Amateur Radio Licence Terms and Conditions document is also available on the Ofcom website. The annual WX4NHC station on the air test will be held on Saturday, May 29th, 1300 to 2100 UTC. The WX4 NHC operators plan to be working remotely again this year as the National Hurricane Center plans to maintain all CDC COVID-19 pandemic protocols until the end of 2021. The yearly exercise takes place just ahead of the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season, which runs from June 1st through November 30th. With more details on the upcoming test, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. It's predicted to be a very busy Atlantic hurricane season, Noah says. The on-the-air test of WX4NHC at the National Hurricane Center will be held on Saturday, May 29th from 1300 to 2100 UTC. The yearly exercise takes place just ahead of the official start of the Atlantic hurricane season, which runs from June 1st to November 30th. Assistant WX4NHC Coordinator Julio Ripoll, WD4R, said the event offers an opportunity for radio amateurs worldwide to exercise the sorts of communication capabilities available during severe weather. Participation is open to all. During the event, stations make brief contacts with any station anywhere to exchange signal reports and basic weather info, such as sunny, rainy, cloudy, whatever. Participating stations may use HF, VHF, UHF, APRS, and WinLink with WX4NHCHF activity centering on the hurricane watch net frequencies of 14.325 MHz and 7.268 MHz, depending on propagation, and elsewhere as conditions dictate. WX4NHC will also participate in the VOIP hurricane net from 2000 to 2100 UTC. As for the upcoming hurricane season, Ripoll says even if you're not directly affected by a hurricane situation, please volunteer to monitor and relay reports. Just one report can make a difference and help save a life. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In conjunction with the National Hurricane Conference next month, the traditional amateur radio workshop sessions will be heard virtually on Tuesday, June 15th from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and 13.30 to 1700 Eastern Daylight Time. The sessions will be moderated by Rob Mercido, KD1CY, Director of Operations, VOIP Hurricane Net with Ripoll. To access the Zoom meeting check-in using the meeting ID 844-9788-6921 and the passcode 565708. Repeating that Zoom meeting codes using the meeting ID 844-9788-6921 and the passcode 565708. The Red Cross Emergency Communications Training Group held its third nationwide drill on Saturday, May 8th. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, is here with more. While results are still being compiled and checked, it appears that some 800 participating radio amateurs took part in sending traffic via WinLink to one of eight Red Cross divisional clearinghouses around the nation. The training group has two overarching goals to attract and train a large number of radio amateurs 
in the basic use of WinLink and to incrementally raise the bar to higher levels of proficiency. WinLink Thursday training sessions were held all winter. For the May 8th nationwide drill, participants were asked to send two WinLink messages, a WinLink check-in form providing station GPS coordinates, and a message containing a Red Cross Shelter Requisition Form 6409. One challenge for that second message was that the sample Form 6409 had been filled in by hand to provide a more realistic scenario than a neatly typed one. This meant that operators had to accurately transcribe the requisition items. The use of radio to send WinLink messages was encouraged and more than 80 percent of participants did so. Because the May 8th date fell on World Red Cross and Red Crescent Day, hams from around the world were invited to participate, and more than 50 checked in from Central and South America, Canada, Germany, and South Africa. The valid GPS coordinates were mapped and displayed in real time during the drill. The use of radio to send WinLink messages was encouraged, and more than 80% of participants did so either on HF or VHF UHF frequencies. The percentage number and message accuracy rate have continually risen during the WinLink Thursday drills. For more information about the Red Cross Emergency Communications Training Group, visit the group's website and sign up for its group email service to receive announcements of future activities. The first virtual rapprochement between the Radio Club Dominicano and the Radio Club de Haiti took place on May 9th. The Dominican Republic and Haiti share the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. The primary language in the Dominican Republic is Spanish, while the primary language in Haiti is French. During this meeting, a protocol for presentation to members was developed, followed by a few words from both presidents and a short dialogue directed toward the need for future meetings to face emergency and disaster mitigation. Both presidents, Hugo Ramon, HI8VRS, and Jean Robert Galliard, HI2JR, emphasize the need for the two member societies to coordinate efforts in order to maintain communication channels between them. Five representatives of the Radio Club de Haiti and four representatives of the Radio Club Dominicano took part in the meeting, which was coordinated by Douglas Lappin, HH2OY, K1OY. Two individuals from the Dominican Republic were guests at the session. As a next step, a virtual meeting was contemplated. Both presidents exchanged messages of praise for all radio amateurs. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. You're not uh, putting gasoline in uh, garbage bags, are you? And storing them for the... F that would be foolish. Foolish. Don't do it. <laughs> people are doing it in the Southeast, I guess. Some people don't. Gosh, I just can only imagine what happens if that leaks. Whee. It's a driving bomb, a time bomb. All because of the ransomware attack on uh, Colonial Pipeline, which you watch mainstream media and they don't have a lot of experience with ransomware attacks. So they, <laughs> so they missed some of the points. Uh, one, the uh, ransomware was not actually aimed at the pipeline operating equipment. It was aimed at the IT department. And in ex excess of caution, Colonial shut down the ops. But, uh, and paid, by the way, paid the ransomware. They said they didn't, but they paid 75 Bitcoin. Pretty sure of that. We, we can see the dark side wallet, the ransomware attacker's Bitcoin wallet, and we can see what came into it and from where. 75 Bitcoin on May 8th. You know, sometimes I've seen this happen with other attacks. The decrypting software that then gets sent to you by the bad guys is so slow that people restore from backup anyway. <laughs> it's like, okay, never mind, never mind. Then something weird happened. The dark side ransomware gang. So, oh, this is a couple of other things. I've seen it said it's Russians. Yeah, it's probably Russians, but it's not Russian government. It's not political. It's just bad guys who happen to live in Russia. And it may not be Russians that did it because dark side is what we call, and this is a nasty development in the world of ransomware, ransomware as a service. So the software as a service now has been around for a few years, and it's basically web-based software. 
Uh, so like Gmail is software as a service. It's an email program. It doesn't live on your computer. You get there with a browser. Ransomware as a service, it, the idea is these uh, these real hackers at the dark side ransomware gang, the real guys have a website. You can even visit it with an ethics statement and everything. <laughs> and they call them affiliates, the people, the script kiddies who don't have the skills probably to do what the dark side hackers did, but they just can use the software and then they aim it around. Dark side says, we don't go after hospitals. We have an ethics statement. I <laughs> think it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, we don't go after infrastructure. Uh, and this, and this was a mistake, but now <laughs> on the dark side blog, there's a post on the dark side blog. Yes. These guys have a blog. There's a post that says a few hours ago, we, I'll do it in a Russian accent because I think they are Russian. We lost access to the public part of our infrastructure, namely blog. <laughs> blog in Russian is so good. Blog. Blog payment servers, CDN servers. So now these servers unavailable via SSH hosting panels are blocked. They also say that cryptocurrency funds were withdrawn from their payment server, which was hosting the ransomware payments. Yes, indeed, they were. So interesting. It's not clear whether it could be that SEAL Team 6 found them and took them out. I, you know, not the guys, just the servers. I've seen people recommend this. Oh, you wish you just bomb them or get them. They're in Russia. You can't, it's not really, you can't, <laughs> you can't just send a SEAL team into Russia. That's a guy that has some significant diplomatic issues there. But you could, if you, uh, if you had some smart guys, you could take down some of their servers if you knew where they were. And it wouldn't be too hard to figure that out, just as we've kind of figured out where their Bitcoin wallet is. So maybe government did it. Maybe, um, there's also a thought that this is just a convenient way for the dark side folks to silently disappear because I'm sure the heat is on. The heat is on. The president himself said, we're going to go after the group. <laughs> so President Biden said in a press conference on Thursday, we've been in direct communication with Moscow about the imperative for responsible countries, hint, hint, Vlad, to take decisive action against these ransomware networks. We do not believe the Russian government was involved in the attack, but we have strong reason to believe the criminals who did the attack are living in Russia. It's kind of known that's where Darkseid originated. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of good uh, programmers out of work in the former Soviet Union. You know, some of them have turned to uh, lives of crime, as Batman would say. So, um, what happened? It could be that um, it could be a ruse using the president's statements as a cover to shut down the infrastructure and, and leave without, oh, giving the affiliates their cut. Oh, we don't know what happened to money. It disappeared. <laughs> He's gone. <laughs> you know, never trust a thief, right? It actually happens enough that there's a name for it, the exit scam. The Justice Department won't say. There is a lot of heat on these ransomware gangs. There's another gang, Revil and Avedon. They have also made some uh, statements. We, uh, we're not going to attack healthcare educational institutes, government networks. We're not going to do that. Now, the Irish health system's down, thanks to ransomware. I think, you know, it's interesting. I wonder if law enforcement in our nation and others have the capability to find and prosecute these guys. And, you know, most of this stuff can be done pretty anonymously. But, you know, you get a good enough, a good enough uh, investigator on it. Hey, we found Osama bin Laden it was, you know, years of work. And some very uh, clever investiga investigations, and I'm sure that uh, his opsec—that's what we call it, operational security—opsec was uh, was as good as it can get. So, you know, I'm sure these guys, as good as their opsec might be, maybe you're feeling some heat. Good, good. Pipelines back up. The gas is flowing, so uh, don't 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 worry about that. You could stop putting <laughs> gasoline in uh, plastic bags. Probably never was a good idea to do that. Just you know. You might, you might want to stop. <laughs> stop now. You actually, the shortage, it almost certainly the shortage was caused by the hoarding, not by the pipeline shutdown. The pipeline wasn't shut down long enough to really make a, a make it a big problem. See, panic. In fact, I, uh, you know, I have friends in the, uh, in the tech journalism business and the security business who say, really, the media caused the shortage, not the, 
bad guys. The bad guys, you know, got their money. They got their money. <sighs> it's a crazy world we live in. I'm just saying. It's, it's in so many ways. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? We talk a lot about Starlink. This is the SpaceX, Elon Musk's plan to put 12,000 satellites in orbit. 12,000 satellites, low Earth orbit, very low Earth orbit satellites in orbit that will then give every square inch of the globe internet access. It is available now in pre-release, kind of a beta test for some people in very limited geographic areas in North America. Uh, it's not cheap, 500 bucks for the hardware, including the dish, which they call Dishy McDishface. I kid you not, that's the name, Dishy McDishface. Mm. Elon is nothing if not a wag. And uh, then 99 bucks a month for service that really varies. It's certainly not for anybody who can get, you know, if you live in a metropolitan area, you know, it's not going to help you because for a lot less than that, you can get much faster, much more reliable internet access. But if you live in a rural area where you've really been struggling, and that really is the hope for Starlink, is it's going to bring internet to places, uh, you know, that haven't really been able to get very good internet, it might be worth it. Uh, the speeds seem to range, you know, between, you know, well, it's supposed to be around 100 megabits, and sometimes it gets even up to 200 megabits, according to some users, and sometimes it goes down well below that, maybe to 80 or 90 or 50 or kind of depends and and uh, Nilay Patel has a review of it on the verge he lives in upper New York State so he was very interested his uh, headline broadband dreams fall to earth SpaceX's satellite internet service is a technological marvel when it works it's kind of cool dishy McDish face aims auto aims itself towards the satellites and moves around the biggest problem Nilay Patel found is that if there is any obstruction Anything in the way between the, the the satellite dish, which is, you know, not big, it's pizza box sized, and the satellite in the sky, it just stops working. And that includes a tree, <laughs> strong winds, <laughs> even poles, he says. Uh, you got to somehow, and the, and the problem is the satellites tend to be kind of low in the sky, so you got to somehow get it out there in the middle of nowhere with no obstructions. Eh, we'll see. I, you know, first of all, the, not all the satellites are launched. Only uh, maybe 10% of the total uh, are launched. Some more to come. So maybe that'll help. There are some, some people who say, why do, do we really need 12,000 more satellites? Isn't it getting a little crowded up there? Well, space is big. <laughs> space is big. There's lots of room. But yeah, you know, that's potentially a problem. Anyway, I guess for those of you who've been waiting because you live in a rural area and you're desperate to get internet access... It might be worth it if you can find it. You read his review because you really need to find a clear area. There are no trees, even on you know on the horizon. Put it up on a hill or a pole or some high thing so that you can you can see the whole sky. That's the key. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. Where were you in 62? Let's take a snapshot of amateur radio over 45 years ago. In January 1962, there was one word on the lips of every amateur, Oscar. No, I'm not talking about the Academy Award but rather orbital satellite carrying amateur radio. Oscar One was launched on December 12, 1961. By today's standards, it was extremely simple. A one cubic foot package containing a two transistor, 140 milliwatt crystal controlled CW transmitter sending high on 144.98 megacycles. The beacon lasted only three weeks, long enough for thousands of hams to hear it. Amateur radio was now in the space age. Congratulations came in from Vice President Lyndon Johnson and Mrs. Lee DeForest, the widow of the famous inventor. Oscar I was followed in June 1962 by Oscar II. Other notable 1962 space activities included John Glenn's first flight in February and the launching of Telstar, the first communication satellite 
in the summer. The amateur radio population hit two milestones in 1962. The number of hams passed the 250,000 mark by the end of the year, and membership in the American Radio Relay League hit 100,000. With the increase in the amateur census, the FCC was running out of WA prefix call signs in the second and sixth call areas. Soon, WB call signs would appear. As for the ARRL, it was running out of space. The old building in West Hartford was filled to the rafters. So, the ARRL proposed a new headquarters at the site of W1AW, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut. The new building would cover 25,000 square feet versus 14,000 square feet for the West Hartford location. To finance the $250,000 cost, the ARRL started the building fund. They hoped to be in the new headquarters by 1963. On May 11, 1962, Herbert Hoover Jr., W6ZH, was elected president of the ARRL. Son of Herbert Hoover, the former president and secretary of commerce, W6ZH was famous in his own right as an inventor, corporate president, and engineer. Licensed since 1915, he was active on all bands from 160 through 2 meters. In regards to licenses, there was good news and bad news. The FCC decided in 1962 that an individual seeking an amateur or CB license no longer needed to have the application notarized. No longer would you solemnly stand before a notary public, right hand raised, and swear that the application was accurate and complete to the best of your knowledge. Given the sorry state of some CB and ham frequencies, I, as a notary, believe this requirement should be brought back. The bad news from the FCC? License fees. Public comment was solicited on the FCC proposal to institute license fees of between $5 and $10. The ARRL was strongly opposed to the idea. For technicians, 1962 was not a good year. A proposal to amend Part 12 to allow technicians on 10 meters was denied by the FCC. The FCC strongly reinforced their policy that the purpose of this license was experimentation, not communication. The license was not designated for communication service and was not to be regarded as a stepping stone between the novice and general classes. The ARRL supported the FCC decision. There was one bit of good news for technicians, a new magazine called VHF Horizons. The focus of this publication was ham radio above 50 megacycles, and for the first time in the amateur community, there were editorials in a national magazine supporting technicians as full-fledged hams. Unfortunately, after only two years, VHF Horizons ceased publication. In technical areas, single sideband was passing AM as the favored voice mode. Transistors now existed that could handle two watts or more above 50 megacycles. As a result, many all-transistor 6-meter portable units were described in the pages of QST. For those who preferred kits or factory-built equipment over homebrewing, there were lots of choices. Heathkit had the Pawnee and the Shawnee, 2- and 6-meter transceiver kits. These were AM CW mobile units which used 15 tubes and a vibrator power supply. Clegg and Gonset also had many 2- and 6-meter rigs including the Clegg Zeus, a 6 and 2 meter transmitter for $675. Polytronics introduced the Polycom 62, a dual band 6 and 2 meter transceiver for $379.50. For the HF operator, Johnson had a full Viking line, including the Invader, a 200 watt CW sideband AM transmitter for $619.50. The Ranger, a 75-watt CW, 65-watt AM transmitter for $249.50. And the Adventurer, a 50-watt CW crystal control transmitter for only $54.95. Why don't you match your Viking transmitter with a Hammerlin receiver? Try the HQ-180 for $429 or the HQ-170 for $379. By the way... Radio Shack carries the full line of Hamerlin equipment. 
at their eight stores coast to coast. Note that these are 1962 prices. Multiply them by five to get today's equivalent. Adjusted for inflation, today's radios are three times cheaper than those of the 50s and 60s. CB radio was booming in 1962. There were more CBers than hams, and an ugly rumor started that the FCC was going to give 10 meters to the CB crowd. The FCC put out an announcement that the rumor was 100% false. CB radios were everywhere, even in the pages of QST, tucked away in the full-page ads from Ico and Lafayette. The national calling and emergency frequencies in 1962 were 3.55, 7.1, 14.05, 21.05, and 28.1 megacycles for CW, and 3.875, 7.25, 14.75, and 145.35 megacycles for phone. And finally, Connell Rad was still alive at the beginning of 1962. Every ham had a monitor 640 or 1240 kilocycles while on the air. However, the basis for Connell Rad was becoming obsolete and on July 13, 1962, Connell Rad ended. It was replaced by the emergency broadcast system. In our next installment, we are going to look at Connell Rad and the role it played in the lives of every amateur, CBer, and U.S. citizen. So until then, keep monitoring 640 and 1240 kilocycles, and remember to duck and cover. In the only contested election this spring, Utah ARR members elected Pat Milan, N7PAT, as their new section manager for a two-year term commencing July 1st. Milan of South Jordan received 419 votes, while incumbent Mel Parks, NM7P, garnered 339 votes. Parks had served as Utah section manager for 22 years. ARRL headquarters counted and verified the ballots on May 18th. In New Hampshire, Peter Storer, K1PJS of Concord, was the only nominee for section manager when the nominations closed on March 4th. Storer, having previously served as section manager, from 2013 until 2019, will succeed John Gotthardt, K1UAF, who decided not to seek a new term. Six incumbent section managers forced no opposition and were declared re-elected, effective on July 1st. They are Marty Pittenger, KB3MXM, in the Maryland DC sectional, John Bigley, N7UR in Nevada, Bob Buis, W2OD in northern New Jersey, Bob Bodet, W1YRC in Rhode Island, John Litz, NZ6Q in the San Joaquin Valley, and Dale Durham, W5WI in West Texas. Time now for the AMSAT report. It's that time of year again to elect AMSAT members of the board. Nominations are open for four seat positions and two alternate positions. If you're interested, visit amsat.org for more details. AMSAT is moving its server to a new vendor over the weekend of May 22nd. If all goes as planned, the whole business should take an hour or two, we understand. Mailing lists and mail forwarding will not be affected. Once completed, it will result in greater operational flexibility ensure continued flow of security updates and may result in lower server costs for AMSAT. If you're chasing some grids on satellites, a few ops will be heading out on the road. Jerry W8LR will operate from EM98, EM99 and from EM88, EM89 grid squares on May 27th. Tyler WL7T will operate from EN 36, 37, 38, 46, 47, 48, 57, and 58 in late May. The AMSAT report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. A new 8-meter propagation beacon with the callsign Echo India 1 Charlie Alpha Hotel is now operational from the west of Ireland and it transmits on a frequency of 40.016 MHz.
The new beacon will transmit in both CW and PI4 modes, with an output power of 25 watts into a horizontal dipole. This new 40 MHz beacon is designed to explore the possibility of VHF paths across the Atlantic, as it is positioned roughly halfway between the 10 meter and 6 meter bands. It is hoped that the beacon will prove to be a very useful propagation indicator for any serious 50 MHz stations in North America, looking for any impending openings to Europe. It is expected that the beacon has the potential to be heard in North America, the Caribbean and South America during the sporadic E season, which generally runs from May to July each year, and also around the time of the peak of the next sunspot cycle, when the maximum usable frequency goes well above 30 MHz. For more information about the new beacon, go to EI7GL's blog at echoindia7golflima.blogspot.com. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that sunspot activity continues this week. Although the average daily sunspot numbers and solar flux have not really changed since last week's report. This was not expected because on the first day of the reporting week in last week's bulletin, there was no sunspot activity at all. Average daily sunspot numbers hardly changed from 21.1 to 20.3, and average daily solar flux went from 74.3 to 74.2. Tad says that he is surprised that solar flux still remains below 80 since April 20th. Geomagnetic indicators were quiet last week, but values were slightly lower. Average daily planetary A indices changed from 9.1 to 6.6, and average daily middle latitude A indice went from 7.4 to 6.3. The predicted solar flux for the next few days is 72 on May 21st through the 27th, 73 on May 28th, 75 on May 29th to the 31st, 77 on June 1st, 78 on June 2nd to the 12th, 73, 77, and 77 again on June 13th through the 15th, and 75 on June 16th through the 27th. Taking a look now at the predicted planetary A index that is scheduled to be 10 and 8 on May 21st and 22nd, 5 on May 23rd through June 10th, 8, 5, 10, and 8 on June 11th through the 14th, 5, 10, and 8 on June 15th through the 17th, and 5 on June 18th all the way to the 30th and probably beyond. Disasters can strike at all times of the year. In one rural region of Virginia, Radio operators have developed a plan that musters enough communications strength to cover the emergency needs of four rural counties. The group of hands is small, but their agenda is ambitious. They are organizing so they can assist with hazard mitigation in four small counties located less than 75 miles southeast of Washington, D.C. In this mostly rural area, hurricanes, ice storms, and flooding are all realities, as is the Lake Anna nuclear power plant. R3 MCOM as this startup group is known, has a core group of about a dozen volunteers working closely together. Many are also members of the Culpeper Amateur Radio Association. Their goal is to keep an eye on Culpeper, Orange, Madison, and Rappahannock counties. Program Director for Administration Mike Murphy, KD7PUF, said that members are asked to use the ARIES Taskbook as a guide in their planning, but adapt it to the special needs of their communities. Mike said, we want to reinvent what we do, providing service, education, and training to a larger community than just those who want to be hams. Toward this end, the group has also begun working with Culpeper County Civil Defense. With the help of Al Swan, KN4AAA, in that office, the hams hope to coordinate with radio operators using FRS, MURS, and GMRS systems. The group also has the support of Ed Gibbs, KW4GF, Assistant Section Manager for the ARRL in Virginia, who has been with them since the earliest planning began two years ago. Contest University, or CTU, sessions were offered this week via Zoom. The complete program is on the DX Engineering YouTube page. These are the CTU sessions that normally come ahead of Dayton Hamvention, which, of course, is not being held this year. QST Howes DX editor Bernie McClenney, W3UR, listened throughout the day on May 20th and says he'll be going back to re-listen to a few presentations, especially the one by Jose, CT1BOH, There Is Nothing Magic About Propagation. Uh, there's absolutely nothing magic about propagation. 
I have a very simple goal for this presentation. I, in the end, I want you to be able to tell when you want to communicate from A to B if that path is open or it's going to be open. You will, you will be able to tell that, not based on a, a propagation prediction, but on the reality of a uh, propagation uh, condition. So it's a very simple goal. Tim Duffy, K3LR of DX Engineering and CTU fame, was so impressed with Jose's presentation that he asked him to deliver a two-hour presentation at the 2022 Propagation Summit. DXers and contesters should find Jose's presentation interesting, but it's not the only one, of course. The other presentations, comments, and observations are also noteworthy. You might want to sit through the entire eight-hour CTU program. It's great stuff. When it comes to special events, the W9 IMS Special Event Station for the Indianapolis 500-mile race is second to none. For the 18th year in a row, the W9 IMS team is tuning up and listening for contacts for the three Indianapolis races. The Amateur Radio Race Team will be active on 20 and 40 meters for the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race on May 30th. They will be on the air beginning May 23rd through race day. The eager guys and gals just finished a week logging contacts for the IndyCar Grand Prix. In August, they will fire up the radios for another week of sideband contacts leading up to the Brickyard 400. Making contact with the W9 IMS Special Event Station will get you an original designed QSL card. If you make contact for each race, you are also eligible for a special race certificate. For more details, check out W9IMS on QRZ.com. The Netherlands Amateur Radio Society, Veron, has released a summary of the results of its 2021 member survey. In 2016, an interest survey was first conducted amongst the membership, and this was repeated in 2021, and 1,370 members took the trouble to complete the survey. Thanks to this sizable involvement, the confidence level of the results is 99%, with a margin for error of just 3%. The various Veron department boards and committees have now received full details of the report outcomes, which they can start to build into their future activities. The results of the 2021 interest survey once again show that members of Veron regularly conduct home construction and engage in experimental radio research. 52% indicated that they were regularly or often engaged in home construction projects. Members mainly did this by experimenting with antennas, receivers, transmitters and peripherals. What members would like to read in Veron's Electron magazine also confirmed this. Electron is well received. Only 1.8% of members said that they don't read the publication. Members indicated that they wanted to read more about do-it-yourself projects. So the Veron Public Relations Committee is inviting members to share more experiments and self-build projects with the Electron editors. Electron is not only written for members, but it is also essentially supported by the members submitting copy. This year, Veron also asked how members were initially introduced to amateur radio. More than 35% said that they'd come into contact with the hobby through an acquaintance or a family member, whilst one in five started with CB on 27 MHz. The 2021 interest survey also asked whether members participated in amateur radio youth activities. An overwhelming majority, almost 72%, said that they never organise or participate in youth activities. This is a striking figure because the demand for more amateur radio engagement with young people was first noted in the Veron Board's minutes in 1980. 14% of members indicated that they sometimes or often got involved with ham radio activities aimed at young people. 14% indicated that they were only active with young radio enthusiasts during the Scouts' jamboree on the air or internet. If you listened to the good intentions heard being expressed, the vast majority of Veron members would say that they operate using CW. It shows why these kinds of studies are important, as it actually appears from the feedback that 61% of respondents never honestly do. Phone, whether FM, AM or SSB, was the most used mode by the Dutch radio amateur, and only 8% said that they never used phone.
Amongst the most used bands were 40, 20 and 10 metres on HF, while on VHF and above, the 2 metre and 70 centimetre bands were by far the most popular. In general, the higher the frequency, the fewer the practitioners. It should be noted, however, that the developments with digital amateur television, in combination with reduced bandwidth modes, were increasing in popularity. Respondents were asked about attending local club meetings. Veron said that one of the most important functions of an association is to have social contact with like-minded people. Social contacts are therefore one of the most important reasons for their members to attend local evenings. This was an open question and members indicated that more attention should be paid to new recruits when they attend a local evening, perhaps for the first time. Members also said that they liked to attend local clubs for QSL cards, lectures and help with home construction projects. Veron concluded by saying that the hobby of amateur radio was still relatively unknown to the general public and was often perceived to be an illegal activity. Therefore, it was important to make sure that the hobby was positively reflected in the news. Veron said that events should be advertised using all available media and should promote the reasons for people to visit a radio event. For example, making use of local press and publications had been shown to work in the past year. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has accepted proposals from nine schools or organizations as candidates to host amateur radio contacts with an ISS crew member during January through June 2022. These potential hosts will move forward in the planning process. ARIS provides opportunities for schools and educational entities to speak directly with an ISS crew member via amateur radio in a question and answer format. The primary goal of the ARIS program is to engage young people in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math activities, and to raise awareness of space communication, radio communication, space exploration, and related areas of study and career possibilities. ARIS anticipates that NASA will be able to provide scheduling opportunities for the nine selected U.S. host organizations. The semifinal candidates must now complete an equipment plan that demonstrates an ability to carry out the ham radio contact. Once an equipment plan is provided and approved by ARIS technical team, the finalists will be scheduled as their availability matches up with scheduling opportunities. The schools and organizations are Belafonte High School, Belafonte, Ohio, Carter G. Woodson Middle School, Hopewell, Virginia, Lewis Center for Educational Research, Apple Valley, California, Manatee Cock District, Suffolk County Boy Scouts, Medford, New York, McBride High School, Long Beach, California, Old St. Mary School, Chicago, Illinois, Salem South Lyon District Library, South Lyon, Michigan, Sussex County Charter School for Technology, Sparta, New Jersey, and Space Hardware Club, Huntsville, Alabama. Meanwhile, the interoperable radio system aboard the International Space Station is active in cross-band repeater mode through mid-June, according to the ARIS website. The radio will be turned off on the 2nd of June during the Russians' EVA. The cross-band repeater operates on an uplink of 145.990 with a 67 hertz tone and a downlink of 437.800 megahertz. In mid-June, the radio will change to the automatic packet reporting system mode. Since the interoperable radio system is considered an experiment, modes in use are subject to change. ARIS is celebrating 20 years of continuous amateur radio operations on the International Space Station. ARRL is an ARIS partner. AMSAT has put out a call for nominations for the 2021 AMSAT Board of Directors election, which will be held on the third quarter of the year. The seats for four incumbent directors expire in 2021. Jerry Buxton, N0JY, Drew Glassbrenner, KO4MA, Patrick Stoddard, WD9EWK, and Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. Up to two alternate directors may be elected for one-year terms. A valid nomination for director must be in writing and requires either one AMSAT member society or five individual members currently in good standing to nominate an AMSAT member. Written nominations with the nominee's name, call sign, and contact information, as well as the nominator's names, call signs, and contact information should be sent to AMSAT Secretary Jeff Davis, KE9V, 1909 South Batavia Avenue, Muncie, Indiana, 47302, 
1-800-273-2044 with a copy to Executive Vice President Paul Stozer, N8HM. AMSAT bylaws require that the nomination be written and in the form specified by the Secretary. The Secretary has elected to accept written nomination materials via mail or in the electronic form, including email or electronic image of a paper document. Fax transmissions cannot be accepted. Petitions must be received by the Secretary no later than June 15th. The Secretary will verify the qualifications of candidates and nominating members or member societies as petitions are received and will notify candidates whether their nominations are in order by the end of June. The Marconi CR100 was one of the many communications receivers that appeared on the government surplus market in the 1950s and 60s. The receiver was a single conversion superheterodyne, covering LF, MF and HF bands. The receivers were used by all three arms of the British forces in World War II, providing a very effective communications receiver for a variety of purposes, even being widely used for the Y stations that intercepted Nazi radio messages for decryption by Bletchley Park. Many people will remember using one of these receivers, which for many shortwave listeners and radio amateurs provided a good receiver at a moderate cost. Although by today's standards their performance is nothing special, for their day they proved their worth when they were most needed. There's a great deal more detail about the Marconi CR100 receiver on the Electronic Notes website at www.electronics-notes.com. Foundations of Amateur Radio The activity of amateur radio revolves around experimentation. For over a century, the amateur community has designed, sourced, scrounged and built experiments. Big or small, working or not, each of these is an expression of creativity, problem solving and experimentation. For most of the century, that activity was accompanied by the heady smell of solder smoke. It still makes an appearance in many shacks and field stations today, even my own. Coaxed by an unsteady hand, more and more light and bigger and bigger magnification, I managed to join bits of wire, attach components and attempt to keep my fingers from getting burnt and solder from landing on the floor. I've been soldering since I was nine or so. I think it started with a Morse key, a battery and a bicycle light, with a wire running between my bedroom and the bedroom of my next door neighbour. In the decades since, I've slightly improved my skill. But I have to confess, soldering isn't really my thing. My thing is computers. It was computers from the day I was introduced in 1983, and nothing much has changed. For reasons I don't yet grasp, I just get what computers are about. They're user-friendly, just picky whom they make friends with. When I joined the amateur community, it was to discover a hobby that was vast beyond my wildest imagination, technical beyond my understanding, and it was not computing. Little did I know. Computing in amateur radio isn't a new thing. For example, packet radio was being experimented with in 1978 by members of the Montreal Amateur Radio Club after having been granted permission by the Canadian government. In 2010, when I came along, we had logging, DX clusters and the first weak signal modes were already almost a decade old. Software-defined radio has an even longer history. The first digital receiver came along in 1970, and the first software transceiver was implemented in 1988. The term software-defined radio itself was 15 years old when I joined the hobby, and truth be told, it's a fascinating tale. I'll take a look at that at another time. When I started my amateur journey, like every new licensee, I jumped in the deep end and kept swimming. From buying a radio to discovering and building antennas, from going mobile to doing contests and putting together my home station, all of it done, one step at a time, one progressive experiment after another. Significant to me, but hardly world-shattering in the scheme of things. Now that I've been here for a decade, I've come to see that my current experiments, mostly software-based, are in exactly the same spirit as the circuit builders and scroungers, except that I'm doing this by flipping bits, changing configurations, writing software and solving problems that bear no relation to selecting the correct combination of capacitance and reactants to insert into a circuit, just so. 
Instead, I'm wrestling with compilers, designing virtual machines, sending packets, debugging serial ports, and finding new and innovative ways to excite transceivers. For example, today I spent most of the day attempting to discover why, when I generate a whisper signal in one program, it cannot be decoded by another. If that sounds familiar, that was what I was doing last week, too. This time I went back to basics and found tools inside the source code of WSJTX and started experimenting. I'm still digging. As an aside, I was asked recently why I want to do this with audio files, and the short answer is little steps. I can play an audio file through my Yaesu FT-857D. I can receive that and decode it. That's where I want to start with my Pluto SDR experiments. So, when I'm doing this, I can use the same audio file and know that the information can be decoded, and that any failure to do so is related to how I'm transmitting it. Back to soldering irons and software. In my experience as an amateur, it's becoming increasingly clear that they're both the same thing. Tools for experimentation, with or without burning your fingers. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I got this question by email, which deals with the subject I prefer to avoid, tower guy wires. This is not one that can be easily or properly covered in a four-minute radio segment. I suggest you refer to the many fine publications available on the Internet and from organizations like the ARL on the subject. I do not own a guide tower, all of mine are freestanding, but I work on commercial guide towers. If you have the right climbing hardware, a ride down the guy wires can be lots of fun too. Don't tell anybody I said that, please. If your ham tower is guide but is designed to be freestanding and you have to replace the guy wires, here's a simple guideline for the procedure to replace them. First of all, if available, check any literature or web pages about wind loading and guy wire strength. I suppose thicker is better, but heavier guys droop and look bad. So the best bet is to accurately add up all the wind loads for your hardware on your tower and the tower itself. Then use that to select the proper gauge guy wires. On a small home tower, you can fudge the mount point of the guy wires at the tower by a couple of inches. So fabricate another tower anchor for your guys and simply install the new ones right above the old ones. Check for tightness and strength before removing the old wires. I would let the two systems coexist as neighbors for a period of time to stretch the new wires before the old ones are removed. After the break-in period, I paint seal the turnbuckles and other guide wire adjustment points to watch for broken seals and hence slipping guy system mounts. A good seal for guy wire hardware is regular old fingernail polish. I use that stuff for lots of electronic projects from color coding network wires and coax runs to guy anchors and sealing pots. Just a little hint, the best time to buy fingernail polish for color coding is around and after Halloween. That's when all the weird oddball colors like black and orange are in stores. You may need to reseal turnbuckles and bolts as the fingernail polish shrinks and fades with time. As with any tower project, strength is of utmost importance. Always design and build for far worse weather than you can anticipate in your area. Over time, all mechanical systems weaken, so prepare for this effect by designing in extra strength and some degree of flexibility. Also keep in mind that during the change of seasons, the size of metal objects change like nuts and bolts. So a trip up the tower early in the winter and summer to check for damage and tight bolts and nuts is always time well spent. As with any tower work, money spent on climbing books and videos is well worth it. You should review your safety climbing materials every year, just like your recertified as a Skywarn spotter. Do this for yourself. Remember to play safety ahead of everything in all your tower work. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Intrepid DX Group has announced that DXer Johannes Hafkenscheid 5T5PA is the recipient of the 2020 Intrepid Spirit Award. Hafkenscheid was very active while living and working in Mauritania during 2020. This award is to recognize Johannes' outstanding efforts to activate Mauritania during the COVID-19 pandemic, the announcement said. We recognize Johannes' unselfish act to activate this challenging and much-needed entity on behalf of a grateful Global DX community. 
During 2020, Johannes made 35,000 contacts from Mauritania among a total of more than 192,500 contacts over the course of his years of activity from there. I am very honored and grateful for receiving this award and really appreciate the recognition for all the hard work I put in to put 5T on the map, Hafkenscheid said. He received the award at the Virtual International DX Convention, Visalia, on May 16th. The award recognizes and honors individuals or teams that activate rare entities in pursuit of providing contacts to the DX community. Here is this week's listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. Visit the Learning Network webpage to register, check on upcoming webinars, or to view previously recorded sessions. Ask the Lab how ARRL's Technical Information Service can help you. Hosted by ARRL Laboratory Manager Ed Hare, W1RFI will be presented on Tuesday, June 8th at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. Learn about the ARRL Technical Information Service and the expert ARRL laboratory staff who answer thousands of questions each year from members. Get tips about projects, suggestions to address various station installations, and help for some of your more pressing ham radio questions. You'll discover how to search ARRL's extensive periodicals archive, find helpful articles, read test reports, access technical forms, and find answers to technical questions beyond the lab. Improving Your Club's 2021 Field Day Score, hosted by Paul Bork, N1SFE, ARRL Contest Program Manager, will be held on Thursday, June 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 0 UTC on Friday, June 11th. Learn how your club or group can take advantage of the 2021 ARRL Field Day Rules Waivers while operating as Class D or E from home. We'll discuss how individuals or groups can boost their scores by earning bonus points, review how to use the Field Day web applet to submit your score, and go over how to attribute your score to your club's aggregate score. This presentation highlights all you need to know to operate as a group for ARRL Field Day 2021. Introduction to Remote HF Operation hosted by David Lemfranconi, W6DGE, and Kevin Schinwheeler, N7KSW, from the Cal Poly Amateur Radio Club, will be presented on Tuesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1700 UTC. COVID-19 has triggered a renewed interest in remote operation. Len Franconi and Schinwheeler will discuss the idea, process, and challenges encountered while getting their club's remote HF station on the air, as well as some methods and resources available for those with a similar interest. A question and answer session and live demo are included. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL learning network schedule, as always, is subject to change, so please check the ARRL learning network webinar page for the latest details. Although the China National Space Administration remained tight-lipped about its Tianwen-1 mission, which landed that nation's first rover on Mars, amateur astronomers have been monitoring the spacecraft signals intensely. They were listening for encouraging signs regarding the deployed capsule that was carrying the rover Zhurong to the planet's surface. The Chinese rover's arrival May 15th, which was Friday, May 14th in the U.S., follows the arrival of the America's Perseverance rover in February. While Zhurong goes about its business on the surface of Mars, the Chinese orbiter will be relaying signals between ground controllers in China and the rover. Zhurong is equipped with cameras, a magnetic field detector, ground penetrating radar, and a weather station. Having landed on Mars, China's next venture into space will be sending three astronauts to the nation's new space station. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology UHF Repeater Association, W1XM, Shack, and Rad Dome have been saved. A beloved part of the campus skyline, the Radar Dome, or Rad Dome as it's known, has been spared thanks to a student-led fundraising campaign and an unprecedented grant from the nonprofit foundation Amateur Radio Digital Communications. The ARDC has approved $1.6 million, the largest gift in its history, to replace the aging fiberglass rad dome and renovate the 18-foot-wide steerable parabolic dish it houses. 
The rad dome and dish were to be removed permanently to enable new roofing to be installed on the campus's tallest building, which has been its home since 1966. The fiberglass rad dome and its dish, which were once used for weather research, have been used most recently by the MIT Radio Society, W1MX, for microwave experiments, moon bounce communication, and other radio-related activities. According to the MIT website, it most recently took on a new role beyond contacts with deep space lunar CubeSats and low Earth orbit satellites. During the pandemic, it also allowed students to conduct radio astronomy experiments remotely. ARDC director Bob McGuire, N4HY, issued a statement saying, We also hope this contribution helps get the message out that ARDC is excited to support amateur radio and digital communications projects of all sizes, including big ones, especially when the results will be so long lasting. So after a years long process involving countless hours of meeting, writing, negotiating, and planning across half a dozen entities within MIT, and after an intense large scale fundraising campaign to save the shack and rad dome atop the green building roof on campus, MIT has two distinct ham radio clubs, the MIT Radio Society, W1MX, and the MIT UHF Repeater Association, W1XM. W1MX is home to a larger general purpose school radio club, and the station is located in the Walker Memorial Building. The organizers of the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo are looking for radio operators with tips to share to help beginners sharpen their operating skills or learn the basics of building. The online expo will take place on August 14th and 15th, and presenters are needed. Each presenter will be able to create a pre-recorded lecture which will be added to the virtual platform for playback during the event. Speakers will then be available in a moderated Zoom room, afterward for a question and answer period. To submit an application, visit the event's webpage at qsotodayhamexpo.com. Last summer, Dave Minster, NA2AA, became the CEO of the ARRL in Newington, Connecticut. David who, you ask? In this Rain Classic Hamcast, we'll learn just who he is and what his thoughts are about the League, its members, and future. The following is a virtual talk Dave Minster gave to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Convention. Hi, I'm David Minster, NA2AA, CEO of the American Radio Relay League. Today, we're going to talk about the future, the future of the hobby, and the future of ARRL. And the future has never looked so bright. As the digital transformation of ARRL kicks in, there's much to be excited about. In looking to the future, we should pause for a moment to acknowledge where we are. Just over a hundred years ago, a young Hiram Percy Maxim was leading ARRL in its infancy through three significant challenges. First was a challenge to the existence of amateur radio itself. Maxim spent time in Washington lobbying and meeting with committees. He sent a plea for advocacy to those families who had radio amateurs living at home and to the mothers and wives who just lost their radio amateurs in the Great War. Maxim's leadership prevailed and the threat to the hobby was defeated. Second, the ARRL had only $33 to its name. It had no assets and only debt. Urgently working with members, ARRL issued certificates of indebtedness. Nearly every member sent whatever they could, from $5 to $500. Maxim was able to obtain the needed $7,500, worth well into six figures by today's dollars, to secure the printing of QST and the organizational future of ARRL. Third, September 1918, brought an unwelcome visitor to the ports of Connecticut and within days to Metro Hartford and ARRL. Influenza, the Spanish flu, had arrived and Hiram had to lead ARRL through a global pandemic. Coming out the other side with members now healthy and their ability to return to the airwaves, not just to receive, but to transmit as well, ARRL saw huge growth in its numbers and an explosion of on-the-air operating. And so today, there is much ado about the future of our hobby and ARRL. I think if Hiram were here today, he would tell us that we're going to get through this and that our future looks bright indeed.
Coming into our second century as an association, there was much to celebrate and many to acknowledge. For the few years leading up to 2014, ARRL management and staff were consumed with the strategy and plan to celebrate this monumental achievement. Year-long events were planned from on the air to the national convention held here in Hartford. A significant development project called the Second Century Campaign was undertaken and members donated, as the best they could, from fifty dollars to $250,000 to help secure the future of ARRL. What a year it was! The next five years, 2015 through 2019, could best be characterized as having had the oxygen taken out of the room. The energy level and excitement had dissipated. Leadership of ARRL became a revolving door and the board struggled with building and executing a coherent strategy and found itself dealing with its own internal struggles. None of this went unnoticed. In becoming CEO last summer, my mission was clear. Turn the power up to 10 on every knob by bringing my passion and energy to headquarters. In essence, kicking the door down every single day to make headquarters burn bright with enthusiasm. Work to change the culture of ARRL and hopefully influence the culture of the hobby itself by starting with yes, looking past our biases and not invented here to what might be possible. Look at activities and opportunities through the lens of, is this good for ham radio? Be more inclusive and collaborative, leaving no one behind and giving everyone an opportunity to be heard, not just those with the loudest voice, forceful attitude, or biggest soapbox. Work to reinvent the relationship between the CEO office and the board with the highest levels of transparency, integrity, partnership, and cooperation improve the relationship with our donors as we turn our focus away from being mission-centric to being donor-centric. Having those very personal discussions about what kind of legacy our donors want to put their names to and to ignite the digital transformation of this century-old content curator and publisher into a dynamic, responsive, and leading digital enterprise. Let's spend a few minutes on some of the exciting things we have going on now. Project Eagle is the development of a new five-year strategy for ARRL. By looking at what we need to be great at to succeed, we can collaborate between headquarters, the board, and members to define what our vision is for the future, the mission we need to undertake to achieve it, and the actions and metrics that will lead to success. By creating an annual review of the strategy, the board can test our vision and mission and ensure that we don't lose the focus or the energy required in pursuit of our future. Cycle 25, five years from now, where will the bands be? They'll be on fire. We're working to bring hams experienced and new the latest thinking and tools to make the most of this new solar cycle. We're working with the best subject matter experts and we'll be bringing you the newest theories, ways to experiment with your own station, and practical projects. A good example is our new NFED Halfwave Antenna Kit. We looked at many ways to provide this kit to members, and this one takes the cake. You'll see it in our online store soon, as well as articles and videos that will feature it. Not just for chasing contacts during cycle 25 from home, this antenna will be great for new hams, for field day, and any portable opportunities. Now here's a very cool project. It sits at the intersection of nostalgia, collectors, and emergency communications. As we did at the outset of this talk, let's celebrate looking to the future by knowing where we are looking back. 1964 was the 50th anniversary of ARRL, as well as a series of devastating earthquakes in Alaska. As the state was blacked out from both power and communications, ham radio operators stepped up and stepped in to help their fellow Alaskans. This was a historic moment for amateur radio, and it shone bright. So bright that amateur radio was commemorated with a U.S. postage stamp. Upon its issuance, many organizations from clubs all the way up to ARRL itself celebrated with first day covers. These are specially designed envelopes with the amateur radio five cent stamp and postmarked on its day of issue. 
We've taken that theme and created a very special gift for Diamond Club donors to inspire them as they go to make their annual gift. Diamond Club is a program that seems to get missed by many ARRL members. For those who are in on it, this is going to be a one-of-a-kind gift with an actual brand new uncirculated stamp and the Diamond Club medallion for 2021. Needless to say, my donation is already in so I can get one because there's only a limited number. A major part of the digital transformation at ARRL has to do with taking our excellence in content development and editing and bringing it to video. You are seeing more activity from us on YouTube, the Learning Network, and then later this year, the launch of our Learning Center. Video has established itself as a modern approach for mentoring and elmering. It's on all the time, available to fit your schedule. It's easy to pause, repeat, and refer back to there are many sources of content you can watch about ham radio on youtube but the very best of the bunch have a clear understanding of how entertainment education and information live as a continuum and they position their content right where it matters for the best possible viewer experience you'll see us working with content creators in working groups video projects video series and in cross channel connecting print digital and video together for a greatly enhanced experience. Maybe you've already seen our recent interview with the director of the amateur radio themed horror short called Decommissioned. With our desire to leave no one behind, we're looking to the future to explore ways to get and keep more people involved in ham radio. We've asked you through your activities and operations to be more inclusive. Look out for the new hams, reach out to the inactive hams and treat each other with respect and kindness on the air. And yes, online too. We are moving forward to put our arms around the vision impaired and blind community to give them easier and more timely access to our content. We are expanding our youth initiatives beyond foundation scholarships and the Teachers Institute to offer new opportunities for students to get excited about the fundamentals of radio. Our new receiver kit offering can be used by individuals, teachers, or clubs to get students building and using a kit to expand their knowledge and interest. We're learning from the leadership of clubs and especially our relationship with Eric here at QSO today about how events in the future can successfully be held online and even morph into hybrid events where attendees can enjoy both on-site and be included from anywhere with online interaction. Everyone is in a learning mode and we are grateful to be a part of how it evolves for the future. We've been watching with great interest a small group of innovators that we refer to as Team Energy. These hams are using Raspberry Pis and Node Red to treat their stations as an interconnected internet of things for in shack and remote access. You'll see an exciting article forthcoming from Dave, Whiskey Oscar 2X-Ray, who is driven by the need to access his station remotely while having to be away from home for some weeks. He uses a Raspberry Pi to control his station and can access and operate it from just an iPad remotely. Just amazing. We're also working with a pioneer in international remote station access, Fred, Whiskey Whiskey 4 Lima Lima, on projects for our visually impaired and blind community. He's also taking a unique look at creating remote laboratory experiences for operators to experiment with the many different features of amateur radio. Again, looking to see how to innovate these activities using Raspberry Pis and Node Red. As we looked inside at the operations of ARRL, we concluded that there was an urgent need to upgrade and update the entire technology platform we use to serve the membership. Some years ago, a project was started to evaluate and replace the system we use to manage the actual running of our association. A new system called Personify 360 is nearing go live and is an important piece of the puzzle for the future of ARRL. Another major undertaking mentioned before is the Learning Center. This actually depends on Personify in a number of ways and will go live after Personify. Once these are running, we will need to turn our attention to the ARRL website. 
It is a magnificent repository of information and content for our members, but isn't the easiest or most efficient tool for accessing all of it. And finally, my personal favorite online tool, Logbook of the World, needs to be reviewed and potentially replaced with a platform that is easier to maintain, expand upon, provide greater utility to its users, and make operating and chasing awards a more fun and enriching experience. For far too long, we at headquarters have been in a call and respond mode to our section managers, and we've really let our affiliated clubs down. We interpreted our role as one of build it and they will come. We've taken our paper-based tools, digitized them, and placed them on our website for easy access. This just does not meet the needs of these volunteers. Our section managers need access to great training and tools, content for meetings and newsletters, and the ability to share best practice with each other. Likewise, our affiliated club leaders need access to these very same things, just targeted a little differently. The future remains digital in this space, but is headed towards being proactive and providing leadership and collaboration with these communities, bringing them what they need to be successful in their respective roles. We are really excited to bring new life to our clubs and to finally meet the needs of our section managers and their teams of member volunteers. Another area with literally thousands of volunteers involved is emergency communications. As new hams enter the hobby, half of them are coming in to pursue an interest in MCOM. With that in mind, the ARRL board has created a committee entirely focused on MCOM and has hired a director to manage the day-to-day -day activities for ARRL, Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW. Paul is working on the five-year plan for ARRL MCOM, and there are no shortage of issues and opportunities to focus on. There are higher speed HF data modes, including PACTOR 4, that are being held back by regulation. Groups around the country are creating portable and in-place Arden-based networks. For the future, how does satellite-based internet feature into these ground-based amateur radio networks, especially on the scene of a disaster? How does the national traffic system evolve to keep in step with ARIES needs? These are more examples of where our digital transformation at ARRL will touch every area of what we do. And there's so much more going on. I stated earlier that there's much ado about ham radio. Let's use that as an acronym for me to leave you today with three words. Nothing complicated, just three words. Advocate donate, and operate. Advocate. Advocate for the hobby by getting the word out. Advocate for ARRL by becoming a member and being a member. That is a verb of action. Be a connector. Get your friends and clubmates to join ARRL. It's hard not to be evangelical about ham radio. And if you left ARRL, please, Keep an eye on us. We are working hard every single day to change your mind and welcome you back. Donate. Donate your time by being a mentor, by being an Elmer. Donate equipment to a new ham or to a ham in need. Join Diamond Club and support the future of ARRL. Support ARRL Foundation and its scholarships for tomorrow's hams and future members. There's much we can accomplish through the donation of ourselves. And operate. Be radioactive. Experiment with radios, with modes, with software, with internet tools and connectivity. Get active with your club. There's so many on the air activities. Try working some stations in a contest. Find time and opportunities to operate. There's much ado about the future of amateur radio and it's never been brighter. Enjoy your QSO Today Ham Expo sessions and please feel free to connect with me at CEO at ARRL.org, CEO at ARRL.org, or at David NA2AA on Facebook. To you and yours from all of us at ARRL, very 7 3. And that concludes a talk by ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA. His talk was one of more than 50 virtual presentations given for the QSO Today Virtual Ham Convention this past March. 
And now, with our final story for this week from Southgate Vibes, here is Steve Richards, Gulf War Hotel Papa Echo. A BBC Radio documentary in the Archive on Four series has charted the extraordinary story of one of the longest running and most successful secret intelligence operations of the 20th century. For more than half a century, governments all over the world trusted a single company, Swiss-based Crypto AG, to keep the communications of their spies, soldiers and diplomats secret. But what none of its customers ever knew was that Crypto AG was owned for over 20 Cold War years by the CIA, the American Secret Service, in partnership with the BND, the German Intelligence Service. The machines that many customers bought had been instilled with deliberately weakened security, a window through which the CIA and the BND could read the diplomatic traffic between many countries' embassies, their trade negotiators and their own spies. The BND sold out its share in 1993 for a tidy profit, while the CIA continued until the company was broken up in 2018. Crypto AG's secret was only cracked last year in a combined investigation by German ZDF Television, Swiss SRF and the Washington Post. This followed the discovery of a secret history, Operation Rubicon, that had been assembled by some of the operatives who had been involved in the deception. The programme is called A Spy in Every Embassy, presented by German intelligence journalist Peter F. Muller and British journalist David Ridd. It gives the chronology of the manoeuvrings, arguments, successes and deceptions of the partnership that remained secret for a quarter of a century. Its revelations offer a new perspective on some of the landmark events of those decades, the Falklands War, the US bombing of Libya from British airfields, the negotiations that led to the Camp David Accords and the Iranian hostage crisis, as well as the daily churn of intelligence information from around the world about both friends and enemies. The program considers the collateral damage of deception on a grand scale. Most employees of Crypto AG knew nothing of the built-in weaknesses of the machinery they were building or trying to sell to governments in some very dangerous parts of the world. You can listen to the program by going to bbc.co.uk forward slash programs forward slash M000W499. That's Mike000 Whiskey499. And our thanks go to Stephen G7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee for this item. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates, Incorporated. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week.